So uh, we speak a lot about uh, in here about fathers and men and their place, position, importance, and authority, and that's appropriate. It's wholesome and it's good, especially in this age of feminism where um, masculinity is being destroyed in virtually every way. Um, we see it everywhere. If you have your eyes open at all, you'll see it. Um, it's, in, it's in the music, it's in the culture, it's in the, the TV shows, it's in the movies, it's in everything. Uh, our, even our, our little nieces, Terry had a wonderful opportunity the other day to talk to her um, uh, because of the fact that just uh, because of her conditioning from entertainment and stuff like that, it was almost unbelievable that God made Adam first. She couldn't believe it. Why would he do that? Women gave first. I mean, it, the, the very notion. But she, see, I mean, it, and it's not because a movie told her that God created women first. It's just, it was the natural outcropping of what she has been conditioned to think about feminism. No one had, I mean, they're, being, they're very deliberate and they're very effective in what they're doing. Very effective in what they're doing. And of course, uh, now they try to blur the line so that there is no male, no female, and that kind of thing. But you know, today we are celebrating femininity in its proper context, amen? Uh, because what God has made is good, yes. amen? What yes. God has made is good. So uh, there's much to say about the instruction of a mother as well. If you'll turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6, we're going to read verse 20 through 23, and we may refer back to it later on today as well if we get that far. But Proverbs 6, verse 20 through 23, this passage came to my heart yesterday as I was considering, you know, I knew we needed to continue with what we were talking about. I can't, you know, just upon whim uh, allow the calendar to dictate what we teach here. Um, and so, you know, if it, if it can correlate, great. And if it can't, that's fine too. I, and I appreciate that also about Alistair Begg, a, a man that uh, I, I've grown to respect very much in many respects. We don't agree on everything, but a uh, um, uh, great man of God. And uh, he's, he's, as I told you before, like at Christmas time, he said, you know, we're in the middle of something the Lord's directing me to as a shepherd, and you're the sheep, and I'm leading to that grass. And it doesn't include talking about a baby in a manger right now. Um, and so he just didn't do anything about Christmas that year. Um, and I respect that. You know what I mean? I respect that. Um, but it was, but uh, it was able to be um, connected to some degree today, and so we're doing that. Looking at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. My son, keep your father's command, and do not forsake the law of your... Mother, Mother, right? Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. So we're not just talking about the commands of the Father, but also the laws of a mother. Amen? Yes. He says, when you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now, I'm going to play you two videos this morning, and then we're going to go right into the message. But they all directly tie into not only to motherhood, which is a good thing, but also specifically to being a doer of the word and how we do our hearing. Some of the words you'll hear in the testimonies in the second, um, uh, the second video show that it was, it was the input of the mother that had such a profound, long-lasting impact on these men's lives. And, uh, but it was, it wasn't, now if they had, if they had viewed their mother uh, lightly and esteemed her lightly, those words have had virtually no impact whatsoever. But it was because of the fact that they honored their mother, they loved their mother, they cherished their mother, and she held the position in their heart that she belonged in, that her words had impact. Are you following? Just like the scripture says, it's talking about if my words have a home in you because you cherish and value the one that spoke them. Amen? Then that's when they can have an impact. So we have quite a legacy, don't we? Thank you, Father God. Anyone old enough to remember a time when uh, the Father's word in the household was the final word? Yeah. You know? <laughs> if you are, then likely you remember hearing a phrase something like, you know what your father said. 
Anybody ever hear that from your parents? Your mother in particular? I still hear that. <laughs> you know what your father said. Well, last week we talked about God's Word being at home in us. And it is the Holy Spirit who brings us to that place. Not only by working in us to cause us to will and do, but also by reminding us of what He said in the first place. Remember it says in John chapter 14, you can turn there if you wish, John chapter 14, I'm going to start in verse 23. <clears throat> John chapter 14, starting in verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will do or keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home in him. He who does not love me does not keep my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So whose words were Jesus's? The Father's. The Father's. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you to things to come and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit functions an awful lot like a mother. He reminds you of the things that the Father has said. Amen. The Father is not currently physically here, neither is the Lord Jesus Christ, correct? And yet, we have His words ever with us because of the fact that the Holy Spirit is constantly reminding us and bringing back to our remembrance in a loving and kind way the words of our Father. Amen? So, you know, there is a connective tissue with being a doer and at least the spirit of motherhood. Would you agree with me? Yes. The Holy Spirit, without question, plays a very feminine role. Um, and uh, and I, don't, I don't see any need for apologizing that uh, because I believe it to be absolutely and profoundly true. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who, uh, who is our comforter. And he, uh, she, uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside to our aid, the one that nurtures us, and the one, like I just said, that reminds us of the things the Father has spoken. It's very, very feminine role, isn't it? And, you know, when the Spirit of God is the only one out of the Godhead that is, seems to be protected by the other two. The Father and the Son stand up for the Holy Spirit and say, you know what, you can talk bad about us, and you can rant and rave against us, but if you speak against Mom, it's over with. Right? I mean, really. And, and they take this seriously. Right? The Holy Spirit is precious and should be treated precious. And the Holy Spirit is, in fact, the one who facilitates this doing that we've been talking about. He's the one that facilitates making our heart into a home. You remember last week I asked you what makes the difference between a house and a home and that a good portion of the time that we spent last week was centered around discovering the difference. And while many answers were given, it primarily, primarily boiled down to a few things, really two things in particular, which we will expand on in just a minute. But uh, the two things are a house becomes a home when it has been acclimated to the point where it best suits and serves the occupant. Whoever's going to live there, it, it, comes from, it turns from being a house to a home when it has been acclimated to the point where it best suits and serves its occupant. Now, it's not a stretch, of course, as you see that we're connecting this to the Word of God, and in particular, the one who spoke the Word with our hearts, that our heart becomes God's home when it is, becomes acclimated to the point where it best suits and serves God and His Word. Amen? The second thing is that a house becomes a home when others, to others, when they have unhindered, unfettered, unrestricted access to all of its rooms. Remember we told, we gave the example last week of uh, if someone came and stayed with you, we might give them a room. But if they're a dear friend, one of the first things we say is, make our house your home, right? Be at home here. Feel at home, right? By which we mean you have unrestricted access to the house. You're, you're not, don't feel like you're, you're, you're allowed to walk from just the, the bedroom to the bathroom to the living room and to the kitchen and back again. And any deviation beyond that is not welcome, but that they feel complete 
freedom in that home. They feel at ease in that home, right? And so that's what that phrase means, make our house your home, or be, just be at home here. Stephen gave an example that kind of drove it home. You remember the man uh, that, that he gave an example of from a Netflix uh, um, show he had watched. He said, uh, you remember a man who went to a village, started, um, started off with a small spot to call his own, but it caught, um, uh, he was a guy who went out and he uh, sought fish that were wild or dangerous or whatever, and he got to this one village. There's more to the story than this, but you know, we went to this village that were previously headhunters. They were not exactly the most friendly of people. Um, he was, there was a handshake between the tour guide and this, uh, this, uh, this chief of this tribe that would otherwise have been dangerous, especially in times past, and he was let in and given a spot to sit in, and that was his spot. And, and Stephen told us that, you know, that uh, um, he, this man had the profound um, uh, impression that if he got up from that spot, he was going where he didn't belong, right? But over a period of time... Um, he entered into some of the cultural experiences, like they, they had a, um, a feast one night, and they had a dance one night, and, you know, a, kind of a tribal thing, and he entered into it and participated in what they did. And the chief one day wanted uh, um, some help setting up a trap for fish, and so he went with the chief, and he helped him build a trap for fish out in the, in the, in the river, in the lake. And, uh, and all these things began to expand his, um, his connection there in that village so that his spot in the village became unfettered access. Amen? And, and there were, these were the things that made that possible. Was, number one, time invested in hearing. Time invested in hearing. The guy didn't go there to speak. He came to listen. Right? Yes. You don't go into a tribe like that and make it all about you. You realize that you're in another person's territory, right? So you come there to listen. The second is that there's shared participation in the interest of others. He entered into their culture. He entered into their food, into their music, into their dance. He didn't sit back just as a bystander and, and watch it. He participated in it. He submerged himself in their interests. And he showed value for their ways. Now I gave you an example of that and all of these really just reveal the inner workings of relationship. Right? Yes. If God is going to turn my heart into his home, it's going to require time invested, isn't it? It's going to require shared participation in the interest of someone other than myself and showing value for their ways. Amen? Yes. In brief and short, it's talking about relationship. Relationship. We talked about this last week when we gave examples of each of these, uh, uh, that we didn't actually make this particular list last week. We did essentially cover them when we talked about the fact that, uh, um, you know, time invested in hearing has to do with how we hear. If we're hungry to hear his word, there's time invested in it, right? It's a desire. It's, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to, it's not a, a ritual or religious duty. It's something that we do because we're hungry for it. We long for it. It's the difference between the child that is forced by the parents to go visit the grandparent and the child who wants to go see grandma and grandpa, right? The one that wants to see grandma and grandpa wants to be around them and will listen to their stories. And some of them even become um, enamored with their stories. And they want grandpa, tell me another story, grandpa, right? And they hear what things were like when they were growing up. And they're like, no, I couldn't have been that way, grandpa. No, there was a, no you can't tell me you were alive before TVs. There's no, there wasn't life before TVs, <laughs> you know, and all these things. You didn't grow your own food. Come on, you get your food at the supermarket, Papa. You know, and, and just hearing these stories and, and, and entering into it and listening and just this hunger. You see, there's a basis for relationship there, right? There's a, there's a, a, a longing and a leaning in to hear, right? So there's time invested in here. Shared participation in the interest of others. We gave an example of that last week. In fact, uh, and Terry reminded us um, of something that happened with Virginia in this last, uh, last week, not this week, um, that illustrated this. But, you know, 
When, uh, when we had on our prayer calendar of you and Jesus, it's a you and Jesus day to sit aside and just pray with the Lord, right? And, and, and Virginia was in the kitchen and, uh, and, you know, she was doing other things, whatever, but she kept on getting this nudge, this pull to go to the bedroom and she realized that, oh, today is a day where I'm supposed to be praying with Jesus. And Jesus was, but through the Holy Spirit, nudging her and drawing her to go spend time and pray with him, right? And I've given you the illustration. It's like the Holy Spirit, you know, as we, as we are walking with the Spirit. And not, not, as, not as a religious duty, again. This isn't something we get up and we put our time in. It's, it's we awake into our life with him. We go to bed with him lying next to us, and we wake up with him breathing down the back of our neck, and we live with him, right? And as we walk through the day, the Holy Spirit sometimes will just say, Mark, come on, I want to worship God. I'm in the mood to worship God, right? And, 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 and for us to just make the decision, I don't care what's going on in my life right now, I enter into that moment with him. Right, and I give you the illustration that you know, if this were a friend, a natural human friend, we wouldn't even hesitate nine times out of ten. If a friend called and said, "You know what? I'm in the mood to go do this," and even if it wasn't something you were in the mood to go do, if it was a friend that you value, chances are, if you didn't have something that pressed on you and made it impossible, you'd probably go. But when it's the Holy Spirit, we're like, well, let me do this, let me finish that, and I'm in the middle of a show, Lord, and blah, 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 and if it had been a natural friend, bam, we've been on it like white on rice, right? But the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and says, I want to do this, I want to worship God, I want to spend time in the Word, I want to do this, and for us to enter into the interest of someone else, right? We are showing a deference for God, and His Word has a home in us, Amen. That's on this list. And showing value for his ways. Showing values for his ways. Where, um, um, yeah, showing a value for his ways. It's a lot like what happened with, and for his words. It's a lot like what happened with the disciples when Jesus um, came and told them, you know, and he lost most of his followers and never followed them again after that day, that you must eat my flesh then drink my blood or you can have no fellowship with me, no intimate involvement with me. And everybody left and said his disciples, many of his disciples departed and never followed him again after that day. And then he turned to his, this, his treasure, 12 if you will, the, the inner circle, and he said, you know, do you want to go too? And their answer was not no. It was where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's not that I don't want to go. It's that I value what comes out that mouth of yours. I value the one speaking the words. So, yeah, I'd like to go. But where would I go? You have the words of life, right? It kept him, didn't it? Kept all of them. The word of God kept them. In fact, we had that testimony from Jesus' <laughs> own mouth. Turn to John chapter 17. It kept them. Jesus is praying in John chapter 17, starting in verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that your Son may in turn glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world ever existed. I have manifested your name to the men that you have given me. Notice what he do he's doing. He's done this by the words that he spoke and the life that he lived. He manifested God. That's what you and I do by doing. When we do, we manifest God to the people around us. He says, I have manifested your name to the men who you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given to me. What did he do? What did he invest in them? The words God gave them, 
right? The words God gave to Jesus to speak and deposit into them, that's what he was faithful to give to them, right? He says, For Father, I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those who you have given me out of the world, for they are yours. And all, are my, and all mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those who uh, you have given me, that they may be one, even as you and I are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you have given me, I have kept. None of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. You notice how he keeps on going back to that, doesn't he? I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. What, is, what made the transformation? The transformation is that they heard the word of God and they kept it. They regarded it with high esteem. Amen? That made them different than the world. Jesus said in another place that you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He says, you, you, the words that I speak, you don't hear them. And the reason why you don't hear them is because you're of another Lord. You're of another father. These words are foreign to you. Amen? But the word, those that are given to Christ, they hear his word and they keep him. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Wow. Wow. There are times when you feel some very much like part of the world. But the truth of the matter is, if you belong to Christ, you are no more, no more of the world than he is. You are an alien, a stranger, and a foreigner, a sojourner here. You don't belong here. This is not your home, right? He said, yeah, glory, that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not the world, just as I am not the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for your, their sake, I sanctify them that they may be sanctified by the truth. What is it that he had sanctified them, set up them apart by? The truth of the word that he had spoken to them. Amen? His word had a home in them. It did not have a home in Judas. And so it didn't keep Judas, did it? And it's not because God didn't want it to keep Judas. It's because that was a decision that Judas made. Right? Judas made the decision that your words don't have a home in me. He did not take the time. He did not listen with the kind of ear that it takes for the word of God to have a home in you. And it made all the difference for a Judas, didn't it? So, in short, the inner workings of all of this is relationship. There is a, there's a doing that precedes doing. There's a doing that precedes the doing of the word. And that doing is the doing of relationship where I am bending my effort to hear the voice of his words, right? If I don't do that, there will be no subsequent walking out the words because of the fact that I never bothered myself to hear them in the first place with the right kind of ears, right? So it's kind of a doing that precedes the actual keeping of the word, right? A doing that precedes doing. There are certain things that we have to do with his word. One of them is we need to value it. If you'll turn with me to uh, um, Samuel. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a second Samuel. No, first Samuel. Turn with me to first Samuel. Mark? Yes, uh-huh. One of the definitions of words is utterance of one's mind through words, and I was thinking about that. And as we have the mind of Christ and we utter those words, it will definitely show that we are not of the world. Yes, that's a fact. That is a fact. In fact, this, that what I'm about to say here in 1 Samuel chapter 
if you go to chapter 2, has direct connection with the words that I spoke to you earlier in John chapter 14, where he says, if anyone loves me, he will be a doer of my word, and my Father will love him. The word love him, my Father will love him. You're like, well, I thought that God, God loved everyone. Yeah, well, this isn't the word agape, it's the word agape, oh, it's a different word. So you've got, whoever loves me, my Father will agape, oh, okay? Well, what does that word essentially mean? In this particular context, it means to esteem highly, to love, indicating a, um, admir um, a, a direction of will and finding one's joy in someone. So if I have his word and keep it, I love him, and what that does in him is it causes him to esteem me and direct the will, uh, 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 I'm, uh, I'm sorry, highly esteem me and love me, indicating a direction of his will and finding his joy in me. He finds his joy in me. That's what the word agapeo means. If I will make God's word at home in me, I'm loving him, and the Father will direct his will towards me, and he will find his joy in me. Amen? That's not even hard. <laughs> you ever want to be the person that brings a smile to God's face? There it is. Let his word be at home in you, right? In 2 Samuel chapter 2, we're going to look... Um, right now, just at verse 30, we will probably look at more in a, in a little bit, so you may want to dog ear this. But in verse 30, and this is when uh, God was dealing with Eli for honoring his sons more than himself. In verse 30, it says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house, meaning the, the priestly house, and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, says the Lord, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Well, the wording I just read to you in John 14, he says he will highly esteem. So what was the difference? Well, Eli, his sons, had a higher place in his heart than God's word did. Which is what sponsors Jesus' words when he says, whoever doesn't love me more than right? Father, mother, brother, sister, or even his own life is not worthy of me. Right? Right? Yes. So he's saying here, you know, I will highly esteem those who highly esteem me, who honor my word above anything else. Right? We even uh, had it quoted to us on Wednesday reminding us that God has honored and exalted his word even above his name. I mean, sorry, is that the right way? Yes. Yeah, his yeah, word above his name. Because his name represents all that he is, but his words are who he is. Amen. Right? Yes. So he says he's honored and he's esteemed. He's lifted up his word above his name. And he's saying, I want my word to have its home in you, to have its abode in you, for it to be at peace with you. I don't want there to be conflict in the home. I want the, the red carpet to be rolled out. And for my word, when it walks in and hears the door slam behind it, it feels ah, at peace there. Because it knows it's welcome. And there's no place it could go where there's restricted access. There's nothing it could do that would be a no-no because that heart is wide open to everything that it wants it to do. Amen? Yeah. So the terms soul salvation and being a doer of the word is really no different. How you hear makes all of the difference. How I do my hearing makes a difference as to whether or not I'm a doer of the word, whether or not I am um, the person who is uh, walking out my soul salvation and so on, regardless of what analogy you're using, or whether I'm a milk drinker or a meat eater, right? All these things are talking about the same thing. Whether or not his word has got a place in me, whether and his word having a place in me has to do with how I am hearing. You remember that valuing it is a part of the process. Valuing it. Valuing it. Valuing his words. What does he say? Desiring him above other things. That it might enter into the heart and find a home there. Because before he ever showed up, there was anticipation. You know, whenever you invite somebody to the home, to your home, there's generally a sense of anticipation of their arrival. And there's usually preparation for their arrival, right? You do things. You straighten things up. You perk things up. Even if you didn't think that your house was messy or cluttered before, you see things you didn't see before. 
you know, oh, that's out of place. God, I can't believe that's been there so long. You know, move that and you do this and you do that and you, you make things comfortable. Because Why? Because you've got someone coming that's not just showing up uninvited. It's not like they're not wanted. You wanted them to come. You extended the invitation, right? When you do these things, you're illustrating exactly what we do with our heart with the Lord. It's what it means when he says, if you will let my words be at home in you. What prep are you doing? Remember I gave the example last week of uh, where Jesus had said, you know, using the negative example of an unclean spirit when it's gone out of a mound, goes, sits there, or goes to dry places, sits and rest and finds none, and comes back to the man that he left, right? Goes back to what's familiar, and he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. It's ready for his arrival, right? It's been cleaned up, and it's been decorated, right? It's ready for a party. And so that demon goes out and gets seven other demons worse than himself, and they enter into that man, and the latter end of that person's worse than the first. But I told you that the, the opposite is true as well, right? The Holy Spirit, uh, you know, it, even though the last time you did not receive him well, even though he didn't really have, his word did not really have a home in you, it barely had a house, the Holy Spirit in his graciousness comes back around to you, Right? And when he does, if that heart has been empty, swept, and garnished, right? You, you, you've been preparing for his arrival, right? You, you're longing to hear his words. You can't wait for him to show up, right? And you've done everything that you can so that when he knocks on the door, he doesn't have to wait three minutes for you to come to the door. I mean, he, had, he hardly gets, knuckle hardly hits door before the door's swinging open, right? Please, come on in. And I mean, you have, you've decked the place. I mean, it is, it is ready for him. The, the things that you know he likes to eat, they're out. They're ready. If it needs to be warm, it's warm. If it needs to be chilled, it's chilled. It's ready, right? Um, I mean, the bathroom's been cleaned. The carpet's been swept. The, the Everything looks pristine because you want him to come in and just be at ease, right? Amen? You've done what is necessary to prepare your heart. And I, I, a lot of those, those preps are not necessarily dictated by God. Now, I expect you to do this. I expect you to do that. Some of them, they're only expected to the degree that God realizes he's honored if you have done it. Yeah. See what I'm saying? We're not talking about a Hollywood star that says, when I show up at your place, I only drink this kind of water, and it always needs to be chilled to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, and um, this has to be there, and I don't, I don't sleep in any other type of... Uh, of, of sheets, but these kind of sheets. And make sure you've got this. And my towels, I want them warmed. So when I get out of the shower, I only have warm towels touching my skin. That could, You wouldn't believe this kind of stuff actually happens oh, yeah. with Christian ministers. Oh. No, yes. ma'am, I'm not kidding you. Oh. I'm not. There, there are certain artists who will not even show up. If you don't pay a certain amount, and if you do not have certain things set there for them, when they show up, they won't even come. They've elevated themselves higher than God. And God's like, you know what? I'll show up. But the question is not whether or not I'm dictating to you what you have to do for me to show up. The issue is, I know when I show up whether I'm really welcome or not. Right? And if I am, you're highly esteemed. I'll find my joy in you. You know? That's right. You're doing it because you want to. This is not something that's wrung out of you. It's not expected. It's not, and, and I'm not saying that it's not expected on some <laughs> level, but again, it's only expected to the degree that it reveals to him whether you are a heart that highly esteems him or not, right? Yes. Because you understand the Holy Spirit's going to do the Father's bidding. That's right. yeah. The Lord Jesus is going to do the Father's bidding. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is not going to have the bidding of the Father to reveal the words of Christ in a home where it's not welcome. Right? So in that level, yes, it is required. But only because the Father honors the Son. And he expects any heart that's going to house that knowledge and house that person to also honor him. Amen? As it should be. You shouldn't have to tell people this in a family. Right? There should be honor one way or the other. Whether they honor me, I will honor them, right? That's the way it ought to be. If there genuinely is love, if there genuinely is a heart that, that, uh, that cares about it and, 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 and wants to extend itself to them, there's going to be this way about it. You remember also this connects with Hebrews in chapter 5 where it talks about a person who by reason of practice, by reason of use, have their hearts 
trained to discern right and wrong? What causes them to have that kind of development on the inside of them? Use. Doing it over and over. Exposure. They have time invested. They have shared participation in the interests of God. And they show value for His ways. Right? Yes. They go beyond being the average Israelite to being the Moses who knew God's ways. Not just the things that He did when He showed up. Israel just knew the deeds of God. If, 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 a, if a pagan had come, if, a, if a, um, a, a, an Amorite had come to an Israelite and said, describe your God for me, they would speak in terms of things he did. Well, you know, I know he likes me because, you know, uh, when we were in Egypt, he, he just blew the doors off that joint and brought us out, and, he, and then he split the Red Sea. We walked over on dry land. He's fed us every day since we've been out here. i got to tell you, I like to talk to him about the menu. And, uh, you know, and, and he splits rocks, and we got water coming out. I mean, he's a pretty powerful guy. All talking in terms that he did. Did. All of his actions. I guarantee you'd have gotten a different story if you've talked to Moses. Yes. Have you seen the difference here? Yeah. Moses has been talking to God in terms of who he is. He'd be telling the Amorites, well, he's a God of love. He is powerful, but he's beautiful. I, I've been near him a few times, and I'll tell you, the times I was near him, I was terrified. But I was also captivated. And like a moth to a flame, even though I was almost afraid I'd be destroyed by coming near, I couldn't keep myself from drawing near. I so was hungry for him. I found myself crying out things I never even thought of when I was worshiping the moon god, when I was worshiping other gods, or, or in, you know, uh, over there in Egypt, or, or not the moon god, but worshiping a... Uh, the sun god Ray, and when I was worshiping other gods of the Egypt, it never occurred to me to cry out to, to Ray and say, uh, um, you know, I want to know you. Show me your glory. I, I was afraid to even talk to that guy. I, you know, I, I just wanted to not, my whole relationship was just don't take him off so that we'll get a good harvest so we don't starve to death. Yeah. That's the only concept I had of a God. But now that I've met the true God, I know he is the one who causes the harvest. He's the one that causes the rain. He's the one that created the seed, the time, and the process for growing the seed in the first place. But he's also the one that has called out to me in my own heart. And I've come to know him. And it's not at all what I thought he would be like. He is powerful. He is um, uh, um, uh, he is intimidating. And yet he's compelling. And I can't keep away from him. I want to, the more I know, the more I want to know. And the more I want to know, the more I realize in me, things got to change. And they're uncomfortable things. And so it puts me in a place of pacing the floor and saying, God, I really, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know, I don't want to change this. I've got this, this Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian God in my heart where I, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that. But God, it's so beautiful. God is so beautiful, and I find myself forgetting these things that used to cling so tightly with golden fingers to my heart. And they just rust and they fall helpless at my feet because I realize how beautiful he is and how much my heart is lonely without him. I have to have him. I am thirsty. God, show me your goodness. Can you believe I asked him that? Moses talking to an Amorite. Show me your goodness. Let your glory pass before me. I don't care if it snuffs out my life. I'm so hungry for you. I need to see you. <laughs> what a difference between those who only know what he, do, he does and those that spend the time to know him. Right? It paints a different picture. Because it is a different picture. It's not just painting one. It is different. Right? Remember, there was nothing magic about Jesus' words. Everyone who heard Jesus speak, everybody, um, uh, everybody heard Jesus speak, but uh, only a select few were pruned in the process. Remember, we talked about that in John 15, right? 
I have pruned you or cleaned you by my word. It's sanctified you. It's set you apart. It's pruned you. It's lifted you up. If you are the person that's wilting and not producing fruit, my word has had the effect of lifting you up towards heaven, causing the sun of God's knowledge to shine upon you that you might become healthy, that you might bear fruit. If you're already bearing fruit and you begin to grow, but you're kind of like a Peter, you're all shooting out every direction, I come and I chop off the things that are unnecessary that you might produce more fruit. My word has had that effect on you, right? My word has had that effect on you. But, you know, it didn't prune everybody. He had thousands upon thousands of people that his voice fell on the ears of. And it didn't prune the masses. It only pruned a few. Yeah. Why? What was the difference? How they heard. How they heard made all of the difference. Just like I said earlier, Peter said, you know what? This, we're not talking about hearts that, 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 that always agree with him. Sometimes the words that he speaks are hard. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. What the heck does that mean? You and I understand that 2,000 years later because we've rest and read the rest of the book, but they were just standing on the hillside and they were blindsided by some weird words that fly out their mouth and flew out their master's mouth. What are you talking about? A minute ago, we're serving the God of Israel. Next thing I know, you're turning it into cannibalism, some kind of weird cult. What, what is this eat your flesh, drink your blood? Right? And Jesus is, 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 he's never graspy. He's never clingy. He's like, you know what? You want to go too? What's he do? He brings him right to the line, right to the place of decision, right to the heart. Even though these words offend you, do you want to go? And he, he had to ask, and he had to think in his own heart, Peter, do I want to go? Where would I go? No, I, I guess I don't, Lord. I don't want to go anywhere. You have the words of eternal life. See, it kept him. Because of the place of prestige and honor or esteem it had had in his heart up to this point, when the challenging word came, it kept him. He began to find himself making room in his house for this new word, even though he didn't know what to do with it. You ever gotten a gift from someone that you didn't know what to do with it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> Here's the Lord. Here, eat my flesh, drink my blood. There's a gift for you. <laughs> it's like, what do I do with this? But you know what? He cared enough that he made room in the house for it, right? And over a period of time, God revealed to him what that meant. Amen? One of the things that we found was um, that as humans, our heart does not always enter into or allow our, the word of God actually to enter in and take its home in us for fear. We looked at some of those fears were a fear of change, a fear of disappointment, a fear of losing ourselves, a fear of what if I give it all, place all my cards on the table, all my eggs in one basket only to have it fail. And so we protect our heart. Right? And those are the ones who will never know what we're talking about. They'll never know because they're too busy protecting their own heart. They can't go further. They can't go to where God wants them, where God's calling them. They can't go to the place where his words have a home in them because where they are in their heart, they're protecting themselves. Uh, it's, it's, it's exactly what we read in, in Mark chapter 4. So if you'll turn there, and that's probably the passage we will close with today. In Mark chapter 4. Six in my mind, I should have already had a slide by now, and I don't know where it was supposed to be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I did have one. There we go. Never mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, John, Mark chapter 4. That's always encouraging to hear from a pastor. I don't yep. know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's okay. It's, it's important that everybody, everybody understands what you already understand, and that's fully, I'm fully human. Thank God, thank God for the Holy Spirit. That's right, amen. Yeah. That's right. As Jesus had finished speaking a parable to these people in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 9, as Jesus had finished speaking the parable to them, he said, He who has ears to hear, let them hear. Notice what he focused on. Are you, what, kind of hear, what kind of hearing are you doing? 
Do you have the spiritual ears for receptivity? Remember, I gave you, uh, we, we talked about this both in Hebrews 5 and the, some of the other places we've looked up, that the, the basic idea of right, having the right kind of ears is they're not fleshly ears. They're not ears that are burdened down with the things of the flesh. Paul said, you know, there's lots of things I'd like to tell you, but you can't bear them now because you have become dull of hearing. Right? Yes. Your ears are weighed down. They're not perky, ready to hear. They're weighed down. Right? He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. Now, I want you to also know, Jesus had been talking to a great number of people before this, right? The great majority of them left. But it wasn't just the twelve who were still with him. There were other people who followed Jesus. They weren't the twelve disciples, but they were disciples of swords, right? The scriptures tell us, like I said earlier, when he brought up, eat my flesh, drink my blood, many of those disciples left him and never followed him again. So we had many disciples. At one point, as far as we know, I think there was at least 120 people who were constantly following him everywhere he went, right? They whittled down to 12 and eventually just down to one who was there at his, at his, um, at his uh, crucifixion, right? But yeah, there, there were a lot of people. And so, and what did he say to these people? Not just the 12, but those who were with him. And he said... In verse 10, but when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. Now again, let me, let me go a little step further. The difference between the crowd and the one who has the ears to hear is the one who continues to follow after he's spoken. They're still in the conversation. They see his words as an invitation to a conversation. The others just heard it and walked away. The others sought him out afterwards. What did you mean by? Talk to us more. Let's have a conversation about what you said. Are you seeing a difference? He said, and he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. To who? Those people who stuck around afterwards. To those people who were hungry enough to hang out with them after the service who seek his face and say, you know what, I need to know what you meant. Why would they even care? Well, it's because they wanted to be able to do it. Words of love. Right? They didn't just want to hear them. They didn't come for a pep rally, which is what a lot of churches reduced itself down to in our day. They didn't just come for some guy to yak at them, make them feel better about being the miserable piece of mess that they are without changing, just make me feel better. I don't want to change, just make me feel better about what I am. These people came to change. How do I do this? What, what is this whole sowing the word and, and reaping harvest? I don't get it. What's that got to do with me? I know you well enough to know that you don't just speak things for no reason. It's got something to do with me. Talk to me, right? This is the person, this is the, the Joshua that after Moses got up and walked away, lingered in the presence of God because he wanted him, right? You see? That's not to insinuate that Moses didn't, but you understand what I'm getting. Of course Moses wanted him. But uh, So in verse 11, so he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Is that what he had just got done speaking to the masses? Yes. was parables. But to them, the seekers, it had been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Not just to hear a parable about it, but to actually know it, understand it. Right? The mysteries are not supposed to be a mystery to you who are on the inside. And those who are on the inside are those that are hungry for me and seek me. Right? He says, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Right? So that seeing they may see and not perceive. Hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And so he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand any of the parables? The sower sows the word of God. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately to take that word that is sown in their heart. Now you need to understand, <coughs> excuse me, Satan does that. Regardless what kind of heart you have, he's successful if you're the heart on the wayside. 
He'll challenge the Word of God in any heart. If that were not true, we would, see, we would never see an example of Jesus, of all people, being tempted in the wilderness. Right? He came to try to take away the Word and challenge the Word of God in the heart of the Messiah. Right? Well, you know, I think Jesus was a doer, wasn't he? Yes. <coughs> I think he was the good heart, not any of the other hearts. So let's not lose sight of the fact that the devil shows up every time. He's successful, immediately successful, with those that are by the wayside. Those are the ones who just casually hear the word. Right? It just kind of falls on their heart, but they're really not paying much attention to it. They're the person who routinely shows up to church, but they, they show up physically, but their heart doesn't come with them. They are not the person that prepares their heart before they come, so that when the words show up on the door of their heart, the word feels welcome. They just kind of show up, and if it was a good day, well, then the minister did great. And if it's not a good day, well, he wasn't on his game today. They never considered the fact that maybe my heart was never ready. Maybe I didn't prepare me. You know, and I know that's true because i got to tell you, I spent way too many years in a denominational church where the Word of God was slim pickings at best, and every message was about salvation, and I was already born again. What I needed to know was how to grow, not how to get born again again. <clears throat> I already know that. What is the, that's the dumbest thing in the world to do every week to a group of people who are already sheep. Yeah. You teach them how to grow, not how to become what they already are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's the dumbest thing in the world. <coughs> and so, but you know, when my heart changed at the age of 12 and I was hungry for the things of God, I was getting food out of those messages. <coughs> Excuse me, I have something stuck in my throat. <clears throat> uh, things out of those messages that the minister didn't even prepare. I've got something to drink up here. Oh. Um, uh, um, that the minister didn't even prepare. The minister didn't even mean to teach me that. He was just quoting scriptures and bringing up things that I knew he was going to tie right back into getting born again again. Right? Yeah. And somehow the Lord turned it into a life lesson for Mark to learn about how to grow in Christ's character that that was never actually physically said over the pulpit. Why was I able to hear that? It was because I was hungry when I showed up. You were open to the Holy Spirit. Open to the Holy Spirit. He's the real teacher. The guy yakking up here is not the teacher. They, he might have a gift of teaching or being given, he might be given as a gift as a teacher to the body of Christ, but still that teaching ability, that unction is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. He's only as good as he's surrendered himself and even then, it will have no impact on Jesus himself had a shallow impact on the masses. Most of them walked away. So don't blame it on the teacher. I'm not saying the teacher can't be stupid. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that it could just be a bad message. But even in a bad message, God can teach you something if you've got the right kind of heart. Right? <clears throat> don't, don't tell me that well, I just wasn't getting any of that. Which I, I'm not saying that, I've, I've never actually heard anybody here say that, uh, this present. I'm just saying that, um, I'm not saying that you haven't thought it, but what? You're, what you're talking about is exactly what we were talking about on the way to church. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes, That's because, uh -huh. no, yeah, seriously. Uh -huh. Because sometimes when I come to church, mm -hmm. I'm like, what, what message I listen to after I mm -hmm. heard you say it again? Mm -hmm. And it's because I'm going back to my notes, so it's just funny that you're talking I know. about that right yeah, now. You, you've shared that with me before, you're right, yeah. But see... It depends on what kind of heart you have. <clears throat> and, and, you know, like you've been given an illustration to it before, something that you got while you were here, when you go back and you listen to it again later in the week, it may be something you get something entirely different. Same words. So who's actually doing the teaching? It's Holy Spirit. Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit is. Yeah, Terry. <clears throat> talking to you earlier when you were talking about mothers, and um, when Jesus came, there, of course, he was the firstborn among many brethren. Yes. And so now God has all of these children. Yes. And so who does the Father send? The Mother. That's right. The, the Holy Spirit. Spirit to help to raise us and train us. That's and exactly right. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Thank you, God, for the, the feminine heart, the mother heart of the Holy Spirit. I am so grateful for it. Well, so, I um, huh? I'll just throw this in for anybody who's <clears throat> interested. I looked it up last night to confirm what the date is, but June 4th is Pentecost. Okay. The celebration of when the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit showed up. In power. 
So anyway, let's go back to verse 11 again. I know we've read it, but let's, with everything under our belt now. He said to them, to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive. Hearing they may hear, but not understand, lest they should turn in their hearts, uh, their sins be forgiven them. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand any of the parables? The sower sows the word of God. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. It's not something that they carry with them, right? It's certainly nothing they cherish. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground. You notice it says likewise. There's a way in which these two hearts are very much similar, right? These likewise when the so um, are on the on the stony ground, who when they hear the word immediately receive it with gladness, they're Peters. They're like, woohoo! Yeah, I like that. Good word, Jesus. Let's go out and do it. I'll jump it out of the boat and run it out there. And before you know it, blah, 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 right, right. These are the ones who are they're they're quick to rejoice, quick to receive it. Man, I got it. That's great. But they don't have a lot of depth, do they? Right. Immediately receive it with gladness. No, um, <clears throat> and they have no root in themselves, and so they endure for only a short time. Three or four steps out onto the water, and before you know it, they're sinking. Why? Because it doesn't own their heart. It was a principle that they believed as soon as they heard it, which is a good thing. Peter was quick to believe. God can work with that. You know, the rest of them stayed in the boat, right? <laughs> you know, it's easy to point at Peter and say, well, you know, he was impetuous. Yeah, but at least he was impetuous towards faith. Most people are impetuous towards unbelief, right? Thank God for Peter, amen? He was quick to believe, but he was not quick to allow something to get depth in his heart, to own himself. You know, you'll notice that all the way through his life. You heard Jesus, you know, when Jesus said, you know, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? Also, some, some say this and some say that. And he said, well, who, what do you say? And Peter was the first one. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Bam, right there. He was ready. I mean, he was always listening. He had his ears perked. And we know he got it from the Father because Jesus said so. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. You got this from Papa yourself. I'm so proud of you. They had not walked ten paces from that location before Jesus is rebuking Jesus and said, it, No, it shall never be, Lord, when Jesus said that he was going to be offered up. He was going to have to die. So one second, he's the Messiah, and the next person, he's somebody that he's got the right to correct. Right? Yes. Impetuous Peter. Right? Yes. This is the person here. Now, can God turn something, can he turn impetuous Peters into stable men and women of God? Yes, yes. he can. Thank you. Yes, he can. He did so with Peter, didn't he? Yeah. Amen? But at this point, Peter. that's right, He was, but he was still... He was impetuous at this point, but he says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure for only a short time. Afterward, when tribulation, persecutions arise for the word's sake, when Jesus says, Come to you on the water, and you get out there, and winds and waves arise for the word's sake, immediately in the heart the word falls out the bottom of your feet. Right? They have no root in themselves, so endure only for a short time afterward when tribulation and persecution arise for the word's sake. Immediately they stumble. Mm -hmm. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. <clears throat> they are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things, they also hear that as well. Right? Mm -hmm. And they all enter the heart as though they belong there together. <clears throat> it's kind of a communal thing. The whole, the word of God's got a place here, but you know the devil does too. Right? He says, now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Becomes. That means that it must have been bearing something for it to become unfruitful. It's one thing if something never was bearing fruit. You don't say it became unfruitful. You just say it's a dud. It never bore any fruit in the first place. This was a heart that was bearing some fruit. 
but it became unfruitful. Kind of like the Hebrews, they became dull of hearing. You've come to need milk and not solid food because you're not practicing. Right? Amen? He says here, they hear the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things entering in. Keep your finger there, and let's turn to Samuel real quick and read the fullness of that passage before we finish this one and close. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, again, if you'll turn there, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Starting in verse 27, and then reading on down to 30. Then the man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself uh, uh, to the house of Israel, the, uh, I'm sorry, the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the ephah before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel um, made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I have commanded in my habitation? And honor your sons more than me. To make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel my people. Therefore the Lord God of Israel says... I said indeed to your house and the house of your fathers I would, that they would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed by me. <coughs> this cost Eli not only the life of his sons, but it also cost him his own life, didn't it? Yes. Right? And one of the reasons why it cost him his life is because he's so dang fat. He was eating all these sacrifices and just hoarding them up. And he was living a lifestyle of honoring his son and his own body above God. And when he fell off the stump, because of his great weight, he broke his neck. Right? So what, how does that play into this right here? Well, the cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. The desires for other things like sons, like food, like entertainment like comfort, like whatever happens to be your besetting sin. We're not picking on anyone because every one of us have a proclivity towards a sin, don't we? The scripture says so. Isn't it true? One isn't worse than another, is it? Sin, sin. It all cost Jesus his life. It would all send us to hell. If that was the only sin you ever committed, that's enough, isn't it? So one's not better or worse than the other. We're not comparing scars here, right? But the issue is, you know, that very thing, if it is found, found a place in your heart, a place where it will take root, it will not only challenge the word, it will defeat the word in your life. Because God's not going to share heart space. He's not going to share it. Either it's his, or it's not. Right? Now, will God deal with you? We're, now, we're talking again about th things that we know. The Lord will share his heart with a heart that's divided because it doesn't know it, right? Yes. I mean, if God were to reveal all the ways in which we don't honor him in a moment, it would, we would crumble in a puddle, right? We don't know. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 7 that the, 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 as we walk in the light, if we, as we walk in the knowledge that we have, we have fellowship with his Son, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all the dumb things we do that we don't know that we're doing. That's what that verse really means. Right? Yeah. And there's a copious amount of dumbness that we do. Right? Yeah. But he's still able to fellowship in that heart because we're not doing it knowingly. Right? But we are talking about the things that we know. If, we, if in the areas that we know we allow other things to grow in there, God says, I will not co-occupy with sin. Right? And the cares of this world, the seafood, the riches, desires for other things enter the word, uh, world, uh, enter in to, uh, um, and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. The difference between the hearts was how they did their hearing. How they did their hearing. It made all the difference in the world. If they had the heart that cherished and valued his words more than others, that was the heart that received. Amen? We're going to start next week 
in 1 Peter chapter 2. You may want to look at it yourself sometime this week. It talks about newborn babes in the Word, uh, 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 newborn babes desiring the milk of the Word <clears throat> that they might grow thereby. Desiring the milk, I put a little cute picture up there. <laughs> Desire the milk of the word to grow, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell a little kitten to desire milk. All you're going to yeah. do is put it in front of them, right? Oh, yeah. They'll bury their face in it, yes. won't they? Yeah. They love the milk, right? Yeah. Well, this is exactly what you and I have to do. He says, desire. Why would he tell that as a command if you had no control over your desires? He wouldn't. He wouldn't, would he? So he says, as a newborn babe desires the, the milk of the word that they might grow thereby, you desire the milk of the word, right? As a newborn baby. If you're going to regress to the point where you're a baby, then start desiring the word because babies desire don't they? <coughs> Amen? Yeah. So we're going to close with that, and we'll pick up with there next week. Go ahead, Terry. Just a thought <coughs> into my mind about the roots that we want, that that part of the ground you talked about where uh, we were happy to receive it, we're glad to receive it, and I think we all are here to a point or another. We're glad we receive it, um, but there's no root. We don't give it time to root in our hearts. And one of the first things that came to my mind when the question popped into my mind, well, what makes the roots grow deep? The first thing was water. Mm -hmm. Daily, methodical, <coughs> day after day, in and out, time, water and of course the reference to water is also referred to in the bible as the water of the word that's right absolutely yeah and, and god god uses that analogy also in um in isaiah when he says for the the earth that drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and the snow um and it yields fruit for harvest so shall my, my word be that comes out of my mouth right so god sends his word like that uh, an example that we will close with i was just talking to uh um, uh, I think uh, Terry and Virginia about this yesterday, about um, alfalfa, because I was looking it up for, um, for um, uh, as a supplement, and uh, alfalfa is like a powerhouse of nutrients. I mean, it's like a wonder thing. Um, even the natural, secular world looks at alfalfa as like, wow, that thing is loaded. Um, but um, and they're trying to sell people on alfalfa sprouts. Um, and other sprouts are very good, but alfalfa sprouts are actually very low in nutrition. They've got virtually nothing in them. Um, that, the, the alfalfa sprouts are really not what you're wanting. You want the plant. And the reason why is because the plant, the, the alfalfa sprouts got roots about that big. Barely the thickness of two quarters. Alfalfa plants have roots that can go down as far as 130 feet, further than any plant on the planet. <laughs> and they draw so much nutrient from the soil that the leaves above the ground are nutrient dense. I mean, they have got a lot of nutrition in them. The baby ones don't have that much. They weren't designed to have that much. They were designed to grow, 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 grow. And once their roots get deep, it is one of the most nutritious plants on the entire planet, right? And so that kind of goes along with what she was saying there. You know, growing a root system requires doing the time, spending time in it, allowing regular receiving of the word, regular sunlight, meaning, in other words, receiving from the Lord what only he can give. And